I'd like to welcome the, all of you today to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we will have our brief announcements period. Then we'll have our speaker, who will then speak up to an hour. Then we will shall have our question and answer period. And after that, we shall have our infamous rebuttal period. There are two rules to the College of Complexes. The first one is uh, one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. All right, we do have a speaker tonight. And 50 reasons why presidential candidate Yang, Andrew Yang, appeals to both sides of the aisle. Joseph Kopsik returns with his PowerPoint presentation on Andrew Yang with the following statement from Andrew Yang. I am running for president because I care about the future of my granddaughter and our society has moved away from morals and principles. I want to be a chief model citizen for America. I am working on the changes by creating a vocational entrepreneurship school for the disenfranchised. I believe in one race, the human race. The only, the current politics only seem to focus on Democrat or Republican views and not the views of the people as they are supposed to be serving or representing. My platform stays the same regardless if I am president or not. Our campaign is about doing the work we believe in now. Let's welcome Joe Kopsick to yeah. the podium. Welcome, Joe. Yay! Thanks for having me, everyone. I'm here to talk about a Democratic presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, from New York. He's currently polling between uh, the fifth and seventh place. Um, he's on the trajectory to stay in the debates, potentially as long as he wants, because he has received uh, $16 million in the fourth quarter of 2019. But I'm here to break it down why you should consider voting for Andrew Yang issue by issue and reason by reason with 50 reasons. Um, number one, okay, first let me tell you how I'm going to uh, give you a little preview. I'm going to do first introduction to the candidate, followed by um, expl an explanation of why I think Yang is one of the most libertarian, libertarian leading Democrats in the race. And also, Yang on several issues not pertaining to the dividend, and them and explain what the freedom dividend is which is a universal basic income proposal that is his uh, biggest part of his platform. And then I'm going to read some conclusions. So, number one reason um, to vote for Andrew Yang is because he's an ordinary American, he's a real person, and he's likable. He's a person to whom everyone can relate and uh, agree with on many of the most pressing issues facing the country, namely job losses and lack of disposable income, which he's noted are our biggest problems. He addressed that directly by saying, give everyone cash a simple, direct solution that everyone can understand. Uh, just as America is a country of immigrants, Andrew Yang is the child of immigrants from Taiwan. He is also a Christian. Uh, he and his wife, Evelyn, have two sons, um, one of whom is autistic. Yang's father grew up on a peanut farm and said of his father that he grew up uh, with no floor and now is running for president. And that is the immigration story that we have to be able to share with the American people. And he clearly believes that you know every, every American should grow up believing that they could be possibly president. Um, so Andrew Yang supporters are called the Yang Gang. They're very youthful, energetic, enthusiastic. Um, they have, they're providing him with the stamina and the staying power in terms of continued support and fundraising, which he needs to continue to compete in this high stakes campaign with the likes of Biden, Warren, and Buttigieg, and Klobuchar, etc. Yang is very popular, he's very fun and funny, affable, accessible. He's been known to crowd surf at campaign events. Um, he is, his personality attracts voters uh, who are young um, and also a lot of disaffected people. Uh, the internet vote, he's known as kind of the candidate from the internet, the candidate here to present the internet message that we need to be worried about the changes in technology that could sweep away jobs over the next decade, and they have been sweeping away jobs. But he's also, aside from being smart about all that, he's charismatic and funny. Uh, he's been known to tell jokes at his rallies, and also dance, crowd surf, play rap music. 
people have written rap songs and made rap remixes featuring uh, clips of his have been talking. He even fed one of his supporters whipped cream straight from a can. Um, his supporters have supplied his campaign with endless memes such as Secure the Bag, along with the Miami Vice style Neo Retro Vaporwave aesthetics and purple and gold color palettes that his campaign has been known for. Um, his slogans are, his most important slogan is Make America Think Harder, which is abbreviated MAP. Yang also uh, has a great sense of humor and less um, political, less racial insensitivity that's been leveled at him, kind of fall off his back, which could be an asset to him in a time when Democrats are increasingly thinking that the political culture uh, and cancel culture and being overly PC might be part of the reason why they're losing progressive votes. Not all feel that way, however. Reason number two, Andrew Yang is electable and he has what it takes to win. He's technically qualified to be president because he was born in the United States. Uh, he's not Chinese, but Taiwanese. His parents immigrated from Taiwan in the 1960s, somewhere between five and 15 years before he was born in 1975. So he's, from what we can tell, a citizen and eligible to be president. He turns 45 uh, the week, sorry, he, he is about to turn 45, and he will be 46 on the day of uh, the inauguration. So he'll be perfectly eligible to be, be president unless it turns out that he has some fraudulent birth certificate or something. So he is legally eligible, and he's obviously smart enough. He has the fundraising, like I said, 16.5 million over three months, the last three months. Um, Amy Klobuchar's campaign is uh, beginning, beginning to kind of tank in Iowa, and tank, uh, sorry, Yang has been on a steady but slow kind of climb upward, and now his support in Iowa has begun to kind of hockey puck upward. So it's possibly, it's possible that in three or four weeks, he could start to eclipse Amy Klobuchar and become one of that top five pack in Iowa, um, just in time for the, for the primary. Um, he has the business acumen and the economic and political science knowledge, which are necessary to deal with the complex multi-trillion dollar budgets the federal government has to contend with every year. He has also pledged to become the first president to deliver a State of the Union address as a PowerPoint presentation, so he can explain all these problems so that people can follow along at home. He has said that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Um, and I put it another way, Donald Trump is sort of a failed businessman, game show host who fires people and takes joy in depriving people of jobs and pretends he's a real political outsider even though he knows the Clintons. The real opposite of that is a successful business, like a successful businessman like Andrew Yang with his startups, who's a real political outsider and never served in elected office, just got an award, from two, awards, two awards from Obama and he gives out jobs as if they were prizes. Wouldn't you rather be on Andrew Yang's free money game show than Donald Trump's The Apprentice Oval Office, that we're, the reality show we're stuck in right now? So Andrew Yang uh, attended Columbia, and he has a Juris Doctor degree, which makes him technically eligible. He's, he can teach law if he wants to. He comes from a family of professors. He practiced corporate law for five months, realized it wasn't for him, and then went on to focus on fundraising and startups in the fields of health and education. He also studied economics and political science uh, at the first college he went to, which is Brown. So most U.S. House of Representatives members have Juris Doctors, and the fact that uh, Yang has a Juris Doctor is very important because it means he really is qualified to talk about these things he's talking about. The fact that he's never served in political office shouldn't worry anyone. Reason number three, Andrew Yang is libertarian-ish because he wants to make many government's programs optional or voluntary. And this is really the thesis of my presentation tonight. And I'm going to show you over the next five issues and uh, end on coalition building why this is necessary. Um, now, I'm saying that Andrew Yang is a liber libertarian-leaning Democrat for several reasons. One, his freedom dividend is almost fully optional. Um, he has several uh, gun control law positions, which are arguably more voluntary than others. And unlike the vast majority of Democrats, he opposes the income tax, opposes the federal minimum wage laws, and opposes job guarantees. He thinks the, federal, uh, the freedom dividend will work better than job guarantee and the minimum wage. And he also thinks there's better things to tax than income, which I'll go into more detail about later. Um, he's also wary about moving to a Medicare for all type system too quickly. So he's not your average Democrat, which I think libertarians and conservatives will appreciate. 
Um, Yang, in my opinion, is a libertarian Democrat, like those such as uh, John F. Kennedy, Russ Feingold, who opposed the Iraq War, and Mike Ravel, who switched over from Democrat to Libertarian, and I think that was 2008. Um, so libertarian Democrats do exist. Yang is the most so-called bottom right or right libertarian of the, of the Democratic candidates. Marianne Williamson, Jay Inslee, and Mike Ravel are some are, that are kind of a little bit more libertarian than him in some ways. But Yang's platform, it really, it really acknowledges, uh, you know, he's one, he's a unique Democrat who gives some deference to just compensation and voluntary participation in government programs. And I have a feeling that he wants to make as many government programs voluntary as possible. And I think Yang is in an ideal position right now to build a coalition between Democrats, whether they're progressive or neoliberal, and libertarians, and unite those votes against the Republicans, which is what we need to do now that the Republicans are the, are the incumbents, and the Republican Party is in charge, and such a coalition and a total embrace of the Bill of Rights and Civil Liberties by both parties, the Libertarians and Democrats, that's what's necessary to overcome this Republican incumbency and get Yang into the White House. So Yang is the perfect kind of person to make this happen because he has the economic knowledge and he's in a political position to do so in terms of ideal, ideologically and the political spectrum. Yang also understands that government and market-based private solutions um, need to be held to the same standards and we need to be judged. Um, they need to prove themselves and prove they have a good reputation in order for people to you know, feel they want to participate in them. So he has made a statement saying that um, there are things that impact investing can solve for, but most of the major problems of this era are non-market-based problems, which would seem to imply that he thinks either government or technology or both is more problematic than markets. Yang has also said something very, uh, a couple of things that are very uh, libertarian about economics, such as we're taxing highly inefficiently and don't tax things you need more of, which I think sounds exactly like something that Art Laffer, Reagan's economic advisor, would say. Um, you know, that we need to stop discouraging people from inc from earning income by taxing away too much of it, by refraining from taxing away too much of it. Yang has also said he wants to make every American citizen into an owner and a shareholder of this country. Um, he's also talked about going not left, not right, but forward, so he's in a good position to unite both sides. He's also talked a lot about addressing the issues that got Donald Trump elected in the first place, which is massive job loss across the heartland which he is basically saying, blame it on robots, not immigrants. That's how Donald Trump got elected, blame it on immigrants. You shouldn't do that. It's not true. Illegal immigration is also at a 30-year low. Um, Yang has also said very libertarian things, such as government does most things badly. He's practically a pessimist on government. Uh, very rarely you find a Democrat who will say that. But he did say the one thing the government does right or best is sending a large number of checks to a large number of people. And Yang can use the federal government's skill on that to put his freedom dividend uh, in, into, uh, into enactment by sending 100 million Americans or more, uh, maybe 200 checks, $1,000 a month. So reason number five, Yang supports curbing military spending and ending the forever wars. This has been a policy that libertarians have supported a long time and also the old right of Barry Goldwater, arguably in some ways, that, like his faction, not him exactly. But the progressives and libertarians have wanted the military spending and involvement abroad to draw down. Yang has said that he would repeal the uh, authorization for use of military force enacted after 9-11. That would end the authorization to continue the endless war on terror. That's the endless war he's talking about. Um, so Yang and Tulsi Gabbard and libertarians um, have all said similar things like, you know, our excessive military spending is going towards things that may not be, may or may not be making us safer. Uh, as Yang said, Yang also said, it's clear to me we've gotten ourselves involved, uh, entangled in military interventions that have not served clear American interests, and we need to. Uh, put the ability to declare war back to Congress where it belongs. He also supports decreasing the, federal, uh, the, the Pentagon budget by 26.7 percent, up from um, from 750 down to 550 billion dollars a year. Gary Johnson ran on reducing the military budget by something like 40, 43 percent. Um, so Yang's position on this is arguably not even as extreme as Gary Johnson. That's uh, you, know, you can feel however you want about that. It's arguably more pragmatic, arguably doesn't achieve enough. 
Um, I'm not going to tell you how to feel about that. But either way, we, we all can agree that the government is spending too much on wars and too much on the military that is not essential to our actual defense. It's just aggressive military spending. Reason number six, Andrew Yang wants to end the failed war on drugs, which would reduce prison populations and enhance social freedom. Um, Yang is you know, head and shoulders above Joe Biden, who has just paid lip service to ending the war on drugs. He's talked about it, but really his involvement with the 94 Clinton crime bill and a few bills a few years later that uh, you know, criminalized club drugs and contributed to this the panic over club drugs makes Joe Biden uh, you know, a hypocrite and one of the biggest uh, anti-drug warriors in Congress in the early 90s. So Yang said we should legalize marijuana at the federal level, take it off the Federal Controlled Substances Act and off of a Schedule 1, which is a schedule designed for drugs that have no medical benefit, which is obviously not true that marijuana doesn't have any medical benefit, it does. Yang is not a marijuana user nor a promoter. Uh, he has said, I don't love marijuana, I'd rather people not use it heavily, but it's vastly safer than people becoming addicted to opiates like heroin. He would decriminalize possession of marijuana and also of opiates such as heroin and, um, uh, excuse me, I think it's, it's um, and he, but he would not allow heroin addicts to continue to possess their heroin, he would just not throw them in jail, he would make them go to therapy. Um, he also believes in providing regulation and oversight of the marijuana industry and taxing marijuana. So if you don't believe in taxing marijuana, uh, he's not libertarian enough for you, but at least he's making progress. He definitely wants to get rid of the war on drugs. He has called it stupid and racist. So he's made some, made some statements that are very clearly against war on drugs. Um, reason number seven, Andrew Yang wants to automatically censor sunset old laws and term limit the House and Supreme Court. Libertarians and limited government advocates have supported this for a long time. Um, one of the first term limit laws was against uh, was on the president, limiting him to two in a row. Yang supports an 18-year term limit for Supreme Court justices and a 12 year um, 12 years for U.S. House members, but no term limits on the Senate. And he also wants to automatically sunset old laws and have a congressional campaign, a congressional committee that reviews reviews laws that are old and have become you know, subject to consideration for whether they should be repealed or not and allowed to expire. And that would help get, you know, Trump said, like, we should get rid of uh, two laws for every new law we make. I mean, maybe so, but we should have someone review it and make sure we're not throwing away perfectly good laws if we're going to do that. So, yeah, sharing power and sharing power over time is the principle behind term limits, taking turns, non-dictatorship. Yang hopes that term limiting Supreme Court justices will return some level of sanity and balance to the court. Um, he also noted that justices would often retire or resign well ahead of their deaths when this country began. Yang also said of automatically sunsetting old laws, Congress is set up to pass laws, they're not set up to remove old laws. Definitely shows an intent to limit government and lower the number of overall laws that are in the federal code and an intent to streamline it. Reason number eight, Andrew Yang's presidency could result in a Democratic Libertarian coalition building against Republican majority. So I've already explained that enough. Um, reason number 10. Oh, sorry, I skipped over something. So, um, I don't know what I did. Andrew Yang opposes, the, opposes abolishing the Electoral College. Um, he supports more proportional representation in the states instead. So libertarians would want to avoid having too much popular or democratic uh, you know, influence on the election of the president. That's why the states and the Senate and the Electoral College exist as well as to protect property from being you know, illegally redistributed for no reason. Um, so Yang, he sat, he's able to satisfy the right by saying, I won't abolish the Electoral College. At the same time as he's able to say, I'm gonna satisfy the left by saying, yeah, go ahead states, have, dem have democracy within your, the way you, the, your state personally elects the president, have proportional representation in those states. So I think that is a great compromise that's able to bring uh, people together from the left and right over this uh, need to reform or abolish the Electoral College. Don't you get ice cream?
Reason number 10, and the okay. meeting supports ranked choice voting, which will give political minorities and also third parties an edge over the two-party duopoly. I never got it. Uh, I think Maine has done some experiments with ranked choice voting. Um, the former basis of Nirvana is a supporter of ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is the kind of thing that allows jungle primaries to happen. It allows you to rank uh, the pre your preference of candidates by how much you support them. And this allows, you know, if this is if this were legal and under your administration, this would help third parties a lot. It would help it help be easier and less often limited and illegal for voters to participate in the party processes of multiple political parties at the same time. Um, so that would give people a lot of freedom to express their political preferences without just choosing the lesser of two evils. They would actually have their think, who do I like most? And they would vote according to they would assign a number according to who they wanted most. And sometimes we would get the second, you know, if everyone had the second most popular, like if, the, if everyone's second most popular choice was really popular, more popular than the first choice of, of anyone, then that second choice would sometimes win. And that could sometimes be like a Bernie Sanders or a John Casey, and that could be very good for, Yang has said ranked choice voting will help make sure that candidates have to satisfy both parties, work pro, you know, reach across the aisle. Reason number 10, Andrew Yang supports other radical election for, reforms, such as lowering the voting age and democracy dollars. Um, you could argue that unlimited political do donations are free speech, uh, but it could potentially serve to limit government by limiting campaign donations, and Yang has a proposal that everyone, give everyone 100 democracy dollars to spend on elections or causes that they support and, uh, and have that replace the political donation system that we have, have now with Citizens United. Um, also, Yang wants to lower uh, lower the voting age. See, the thing is about 17-year-olds who are voting, like, there are 17-year-olds in half the states in America who can't vote in the primaries when the candidates being chosen in the primaries will be in the election, uh, you know, in November. Like, they won't be able to help choose who will be on that stage, the final slate of uh, candidates. And in a sense, they should have the ability to do that. So more states need to allow 17-year-olds to vote, at least in primary. And if you can get on board with that, then why not consider that 16 and 17-year-olds are affected by labor laws, health insurance laws, financial laws, which affect their relationship with employers, health insurers, student loan agencies, and others. They, they ought to be able to vote, especially if they're independent or working. Um, Andrew Yang also believes that uh, this democracy dollars plan would help wash out lobbyists' cash by a factor of eight to one. So he said. Reason number 12, Andrew Yang's approach to states' rights is straightforward and unique. Make more states. It's mostly Democrats and progressives who want to make the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico states, right? But it's mostly libertarians and conservatives who like the concept of state rights in the Tenth Amendment. Yang's compromise is simple. Make Puerto Rico a state and make the District of Columbia a state too. It'll achieve the left's goals of giving more representation to majority minority districts, those two districts, and it would also increase the size of the Senate, which could serve to limit the power of the House and minority, and, and, sorry, the power of the House and majorities, which the Senate is there for. They're to represent minorities and basically property holders. It's supposed to be there to provide a balance. Reason number 13, Yang supports two pieces of gun control legislation which compensate gun owners, and that is the gun buyback program. And I should note, it's you know, participation in the buyback program is perfectly voluntary. It might have some, it definitely has some uh, some bad effects, such as where the guns can end up. And you can heard that it's ended up that some guns um, sold to the police and gun buyback programs have been, have ended up, uh, being involved in police-related killings. So it may not be a good program, but you can at least argue that it's voluntary and it fully compensates the person who agrees to participate in the program. And as at least one piece of gun control legislation is arguably libertarian or voluntary. So you gotta give Yang a little credit for trying, even though there are a lot of gun control policies that he does support, which libertarians would not be like to get on board with. Um, one bullet time. Reason number 14, yeah. Yang respects the, the rights of the states to continue to make their own open carry and concealed carry laws. I'm going to make sure I get through all these, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through a few more. Reason number 15, still Yang... Got some time, so. still got some time, so. Still got some time. Sure. Definitely. 
Yang wants the people to be free to sue gun manufacturers, but return the power to the people. Now, Yang has said, I'd start fun, uh, finding gun manufacturers a million dollars for each person killed by their weapons. That would get more companies focused on how to keep guns out of the hands of those who would do others harm. Now, obviously, this doesn't seem like a very libertarian or pro-gun position off the bat, but he at least believes in people's rights to sue gun manufacturers. Now, this doesn't involve some new positive right of the government giving people the right to sue gun manufacturers. If you look at Yang's position on iSideWith.com, it says that Yang's position is just that we should repeal laws which limit our right to sue those gun manufacturers. It's a perfectly libertarian and limited government position. It's jury's job, not the legislators, to decide whether gun manufacturers should be held responsible for the people they, have, uh, people they sell guns to. Yes, You'll get your turn, Charlie. Okay. Reason number 16. Reason number 16, he supports a moderate approach to Medicare for All, favoring a transition, and Medicare for All but opt-in. You might have heard some kind of misleading things about Yang in both directions. There's some debate over whether he supports Medicare for All even at all, because he said he supports a robust public, uh, public option and a transition to Medicare for All with a period where we don't, where we don't abolish private health insurance but let private health insurance we get through our employers kind of compete with the government option for legitimacy and reputation and costs and things like that. And you would have to opt into Medicare if you lose your, uh, if you get fired or lose your insurance. Um, so this sort of middle position has been endorsed by the likes of Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, and Amy Klobuchar. Um, I forget. The, the Buttigieg version had some good Medicare for America, I think it was called. But Yang is, he's kind of giving in to this. It's kind of, Sanders criticized it as like, oh, these are Republican talking points that these people are asking us at the debate. But Yang is kind of saying, no, there's some truth to this. We do need to let the government plan and the private plan complete, compete for legitimacy alongside each other. And a, a too quick transition to Medicare could be disastrous. Like, we, we don't know. Um, I don't know so, what his time frame is on that, so um, I'm not sure how how many questions I'll be able to answer on the topic. But I'll have to say that I've been saying that someone should come out with like what I would call a truly optional public option, where you don't, where you're not automatically put into it, where you can choose whether to participate in it, and that would be that would be allowing voluntary participation in government programs. <coughs> just, that's what we want to see more of: limited government, voluntary participation in whatever programs people exist, exist. Reason number 17, Andrew Yang's opposition to circumcision sparks an important conversation and is personal, not political. I won't say too much about this. I know it's a sensitive issue. Um, Andrew Yang believes that it is not medically necessary. He has personally chosen not to circumcise his sons along with his wife. He believes in informing parents that it's entirely up to them whether the infant gets circumcised, and he does not support banning circumcision. Reason number 18, he's intelligent on math, science, and technology, and he will, M-A-T-H, make America think again. He understands not only science and technology, but also math, economics, uh, science and technology make his platform what it is, uh, but his intelligence on math and economics show that he can do a lot of work towards solving our various budget crises and tax revenue collection crises. Um, one thing that sets libertarians apart from Democrats and Republicans is their understanding of economics. Um, Andrew Yang, I think, would, I think he would prompt a renewed interest in study of mon monetary policy and economics, and maybe there would be some spillover effect. Maybe he would study Austrian economics and other feels that libertarians admire in economics. So he's proving that he's intelligent enough to tackle these things like a $2.4 trillion, $2.4 to $3.1 trillion, depending on how you, how you look at it, universal basic income proposal. And he's really the only candidate in the Democratic field who can give Bernie Sanders a run for his money when it comes to citing statistics about the economy and poverty and things we want to know about in terms of pure statistics. Reason number 19, Andrew Yang would be an infrastructure president. He would modernize the energy grid, he would uh, potentially build a thorium reactor, and he would bring back the Office of Technology Assessment. He says the government's at least 20 years behind on technology because at least 20 years ago we abolished that office. One of his supporters is billionaire and um, founder of infrastructure company, The Boring Company, Elon Musk. 
So you can't even imagine what a President Yang and his best friend, billionaire Elon Musk, could accomplish together. I think that everything the public couldn't convince Yang to do with public money, probably Musk would volunteer to fund privately. Like we can't imagine how much technological and information technology acceleration, space, space exploration acceleration, that we could have over the next decade if Andrew Yang had eight years in office. He would be an infrastructure president, a science president, president the science students and kids could look up to. On the left, you'll see a just giant map of Andrew Yang's positions. He has a very comprehensive platform. Um, Mike Gravel is the only one I think you can compare to in terms of size. And on the right, you'll see Andrew Yang's explanation of how this $2.35 trillion plan is going gonna, is gonna to be paid for. Um, so I'm going to go through the, uh, the freedom dividend stuff now. Andrew Yang is doing this, he's doing this because revolutions in automation and artificial intelligence are going to bring job losses that we have to plan for. He calls what's going to happen over the next 10 years the fourth industrial revolution, and he he's memorized the five most common jobs in America, which include retail and trucking, and he explains how all five of those jobs are going to be decimated by the coming wave of automation. Um, he understands how technology is going to change society and the economy much more than anyone else who's even mentioned his top issues like automation, which Elizabeth Warren has mentioned, and basic income, which, uh, uh, sorry, Marianne Williamson has kind of touched on. So if Andrew Yang became president and the Freedom Dividend were passed, uh, he would be paying people to do whatever it is they please, whatever they see is the most desirable according to their own assessments of their own needs and wants. It would take the bureaucratic planning and the expense of it out of the equation and put the decision making directly in the hands of the person doing the buying and the planning and balancing their checkbook every week. Some people would take time off of, a, of a work to write or create music or art or perhaps take care of their children, put away small amounts of money for emergencies, take care of health problems. Um, but those, you know, you may not see those things as socially desirable or things that deserve our tax money, but they all help achieve households' goals without transferring any responsibility onto society to make sure they succeed. So they benefit, universal basic income would benefit individuals and society at the same time. Reason number 21, Andrew Yang has, a has an understanding of resource-based currency and therefore potentially hard money. Um, so his understanding of monetary policy is better than most. He has pitched the freedom dividend, the basic income he's running on, as a tech check. It's a way of taxing big tech companies to, because internet, techno, internet information is what he calls the oil of the 20th century, and it's very valuable, and they're making a lot of profit. These big tech companies are selling our internet information, what we buy. And Andrew Yang wants to, tech, wants to tax every Amazon purchase and tax every robot truck mile to fund the government and to fund the freedom dividends. Um, and the fact that Yang touts Alaska's adoption of a basic income, which is called the Alaska Permanent Fund, started in 82, uh, it shows these things about monetary policy, and that is backed by oil. The Alaskan citizens call that the oil check, and they receive between 1000 and 2000 a year, um, which means a family of four can receive up to 8000 a year. And that is decreased poverty, increased job creation. Yang has even joked that the oil of the 20th century is, in fact, marijuana. Now, it seemed like he was joking, but he does support taxing marijuana. And it's clear that he's thinking about having our currency actually backed by something instead of just promises that, yeah, eventually we're going to figure out how to, who to tax and we're going to tax them and we're going to pay off this debt. It's like our money's not solvent until we figure out how to do that. And Yang is like, back it with oil, back it with marijuana, back it by promising to tax these billionaires that are selling our information and obviously have all this money and been escaping taxes for years and years. It's like it's, it's almost too obvious. Number 22, the freedom dividend will save capitalism by increasing personal wealth and private property ownership for all. Now, some of you here might not want to save capitalism, and I say fair enough, but Yang wants what he calls human-centered capitalism, and he wants capital, he doesn't want socialism. Freedom dividend is not socialism, according to him. He says the purpose is to have capitalism where you, where you don't start at zero dollars. The uh, poverty level is 12,700. He wants to put people at 12,000. Don't let people slip below 97% of the poverty level. 
not a bad idea. Basic humanity. And he says to put humanity first because well, we need to give people money so that well, you're preventing a robot uprising. We don't want robots to take all our jobs. And the more money people have and the more robots they own, the less likely that our jobs and our freedom could eventually be taken by robots. And, you know, allowing computers to spy on us for these companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Facebook that have hundreds of millions of dollars government contracts to spy on us and uh, provide, you know, move things around for the military. Reason number 23, the freedom dividend is not mainstream democratic policy, and that shows the Democrats are open to new ideas. It also shows that Yang is not under the control of the Democratic National uh, com Committee. Basic income hasn't been a popular democratic uh, idea since the days of Martin Luther King, the fact that uh, Yang is noted in touting MLK support of the basic income. So. Yang's proposals are widening this Overton window of political discourse. He's demonstrating he's not a tool of the DNC. He can bring together the progressive leaders within the Democratic Party and also those who <laughs> give in to the so-called moderators' talking points about, well, how do we know Medicare for all is going to work immediately? He's clearly thinking about all these things and he's trying to satisfy everyone at the same time. That's why there's so much crossover support and he's talking about how libertarians um, are among his supporters. Reason number 24 to support Yang, his policies will, will, will result in lower taxes and increased economic opportunity and responsibility. So Yang notes that there's a lot of people who have never really had a secure income of $1,000 a month. And people act very differently when they have a secure stream of income and they don't have to worry about how they're going to feed their kids or put a roof over their head the next month. So. Yang says that giving these people who've never had an opportunity to be financially responsible put money in their hands so that they're kind of forced to be. They'll have to think about how they're going to spend that money. And the kids growing up under the Yang administration, they know that when they're going to turn 18, they're going to have $1,000 a month. They're going, to, they're going to be ready to spend it, and they're going to want to spend it, and want to spend it wisely. And Yang has also suggested um, having more money management courses in high school, and that will help that process along. And uh, yeah, like I said, he supports abolishing the income tax, or at least decreasing it. Um, sorry, let's just move on here. Reason number 25, Yang wants to simplify the tax code, which libertarians and conservatives have wanted for decades. Yang wrote on his website, at the beginning of each year, Americans dread the coming of tax season. The specter of needing to figure out the complex rules of the tax code hangs over each of us for the first third of the year, and most of us rush during April to come in under the deadline. He said most of us dread paying taxes for good reason. None of us has time to figure out where the receipts are and what we owe, and we're constantly stressed that we're screwing things up or leaving money on the table. Says 75% of Americans receive refunds. They've been giving the government an interest-free loan through most of the year. That's a very libertarian thing to say. It shows he understands that the, the value of our money is going down the longer we're hanging on to it. And the longer we let the government save it for us, the more money they make off of the money that we let them hang on to. Rich will keep their money. So Yang says that uh, the tax system is so Byzantine that it's Turning, it's as if they're trying to turn us into a nation of tax experts, and he says it's a ridiculous waste of citizen time and energy. So he has proposed what is essentially, I don't know what to call it, except for elective taxation. He says that citizens should decide what they consider is a taxable event. But let's not get ridiculous. Like, of course, he's not going to involve, you know, not going to allow profiteers or billionaires to get off scot free and not pay their taxes. But ordinary people earning earned income which that's what it is. There's a difference between earned income that you make through labor and something which is legally called unearned income. Income for profit, corporate corporate income. They're different things and they should be taxed differently. And Yang, to some extent, has acknowledged this. Um, it's, it's better to just let people who are making twelve dollars to $30,000 just not pay any taxes and just tax billionaires more or tax something else. And Google Henry George if you want to hear my personal opinions about what else to tax. I don't need to go into it here. Reason number six to support Yang is he admits that earned income isn't the best source of tax revenue. I think I've said enough about that right now. Um, 
he supports having a value added tax instead of, instead of income, and like I said, uh, taxing big tech companies such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, Uber, and Lyft to uh, supplement supplement the, the, you know, the lack of revenue and the deficit problem. And potentially this would stop adding to the debt. Um, people think that Yang just wants an increase in the overall budget. He only wants this freedom dividend. It's designed to replace an equivalent amount of spending. It's to have the government stop spending it and have the people start spending it. So somewhere around 55% of total federal government spending. <coughs> More on the freedom dividend. The freedom dividend is not a stimulus. It is not a bailout for the elite. It is a bailout for we the people, if it's any kind of bailout. People have been calling for, people have been saying since the 2007-2009 financial crisis, where's my bailout? All these companies get their bailouts, where's mine? And it's almost as if they bailed out everyone except we the people. They bailed out the, uh, the farmers after they had the steel tariffs changed. Um, and you know the whole steel tariffs to farm tariffs thing that that was completely predictable. It's predict predicted by Henry Hazlitt uh, 70 years ago. So Yang wants to stop the bailouts to companies that already have enough of your money and my money, which it is your money and my money because you know of all the benefits that the government give to these companies, like their LLC status and uh, their police protections and their IP and their trade promotions overseas and countless other things. So Yang might not get on board with all of those libertarian criticisms of, uh, of business, but he at least is he's at least thinking about these things. And he's trying to make sure that people are compensated when they're forced to uh, submit to government programs. What is the freedom dividend except giving us money as compensation for having to use money. Like, I don't want to have to use money. When you stop using money, you kind of die. Like, there's lots of other things we could use besides money. So I think it's pretty inconvenient. They tell me it's for convenience, but I think uh, probably the inconvenience is that they, you know, you got serial numbers on your money, people. They're tracking every purchase you make. Like, it's insane. If they're going to give us this device to track us, they should at least, you know. And Yang has also mentioned with this whole tech check thing. He, he not only wants to uh, tax billionaire companies that are collecting our data, he wants to make it fully optional whether they collect this data in the first place. Like, you should be able to turn off, if you've ever read 1984, the telescreen. You know, turn off the monitoring. And he also believes that you should be able to choose between not being monitored, not having your data collected, and not getting any money from it versus getting some compensation and choosing to be monitored. So that's his stance on the link. He understands this, you know, there's a link between big tech and IP and automation and jobs and immigration. He's articulating that he really understands the comprehensive problems of America and how they're related to each other. And that's just one example. Uh, some people are worried that um, freedom dividend will result in net growth to the size or budget of the federal government. But as I showed you in that, uh, in this diagram, increased taxes, increased uh, job creation, and poverty alleviation is what he thinks, you know, this is how he's going to fund the freedom dividend, and it's poverty alleviation and job creation and increased opportunity, increased financial responsibility. These are all the things that he thinks are going to stop this from causing inflation. And I've said on your handout tonight that it won't cause inflation, but if it does, it'll be unnoticeable um, because people people will spend it. People, people will spend it a lot more than they will save it. There will be some saving. Um, I've done some calculations. People think that, you know, Yang says that this will cost 2.35 or 2.4 trillion dollars. Some people say it'll be way more, like three point something. I think it'll be, you know, if everyone who is eligible opts into it, which is, you know, every American except non-citizens and children, and I think it will be optional for seniors, I'm not sure about that, he might have changed that, but, so the number of people who are um, eligible for it, if they all opted in and got $12,000 a year, it would be a maximum cost of $3.1 trillion. But, I can only assume that Yang figures that the, the quarter richest of Americans will just opt out of it because they don't, they don't need thousand dollars extra a month won't do them any good and it won't be worth it to go get it 
That must be what he figures because I guess he thinks that 75% of those eligible um, are going to opt in, and that that must be where he gets this $2.4 trillion figure Thank from. I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it. He's written two books, and I don't have time to go over all of it. I haven't read those books also. <laughs> yeah, he also supports uh, tax and carbon. Uh, I'm not a fan of that, but it's a thing that Democrats and conservatives kind of used to get along about because he's trying to reach across the aisle there. Like I said, he thinks that the freedom dividend is going to function as a replacement for federal minimum wage laws. He doesn't see federal minimum wage laws as necessary, and I really don't either. Because the federal, sorry, the freedom dividend would give money to people even if they don't work. Now, there's this whole concern about Yang, and I know I'm just glossing over the last 20 reasons here, but there's this whole concern that if, if you give people free money, it's going to discourage them from working, or it's going to encourage them to be lazy. Yeah. Income tax already discourages them from working. You can't possibly discourage people from working any more as it is. Stop taking their money, start giving their money. Giving them money. If I would have had time to add memes to this, I would have shown you a meme that says, make sure not to vote for Andrew Yin, who promises to take $1,000 a month from everyone. And that was a funny meme, but it's like, wait, there are politicians who take $1,000 or more from us every month. Every politician. So, like I said, stop taking people's money through income taxes. Start giving them money by taxing billionaires who are making money spying on us and replacing our jobs with robots. Replacing us with robots at the job site. Um, like I said, Yang thinks this will increase financial stability and personal responsibility. It's give people a chance to have money in their hands and plan for it. I think it will increase awareness of economic policy, financial policy, and monetary policy. Um, make the dollar arguably a sort of public utility. He said, you know, make every citizen an owner and shareholder of the country. Why not make every citizen an owner and shareholder of the, the token that you need to get everything you want in this Chuck E. Cheese-like amusement park that, you know, is, is increasingly what America is becoming when it's game show president now. So it's possible the freedom dividend could cause interest rates to fall. So in addition to Andrew Yang promising to run for president and give $1,000 to everyone who won, he's also giving a family in, uh, in Iowa and New Hampshire, coincidentally enough, ha, 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 He's giving two families $1,000 a month to kind of do a test run for this. Now, there's all kinds of countries all over the world who've done test runs of this. Canada, um, Venezuela, Norway, lots of them. Um, but the important, my point is here that Andrew Yang's not only giving away money as part of his policy, he's giving it away personally. And if he does that, just the fact that he's doing that, whether he inspires other people or not, and especially if he does inspire other people, there will be more and more people giving away free money just to see if it works, to see if it helps people. More charity and more people with disposable income is going to lead to more charity, whether it's poor people giving the money or rich people giving the money, or both. So we will, in effect, we could that could potentially lower the interest rate because what is free money but a zero percent loan? So it's possible that government interest rates could decrease as a result of Andrew Yang and lots of other people giving away their money for free, especially now that poor people will have this freedom dividend to save some, spend some, give some away to the poor, do whatever they want with it. And this could, you know, this is minimal government inv involvement. We don't need to force the government to lower its interest rates. We could just have more private citizens giving away free money to people. That would lower interest rates in and of itself. If I understand about anything about economics, feel free to correct me in rebuttals. Um, some people say the freedom dividend is untested. It is not untested. People point to the failure of basic income in Finland and say they paid people and they stayed home and didn't work. Well. That's fine. They needed to rest. Finland's overworked. There's half a million immigrants in Finland who are, who are stu and young people who are stuck in two-year internships that are unpaid just on the promise that they'll get paid eventually or get offered a paying job. Um, yeah, getting paid enough is, is the problem. People don't have enough money. People can't, the problem is not that people aren't working hard enough for the money that they're getting. It's that you can't work adequately. You can't be a good, you know, you can't be a contributor to your workplace if you show up 
overworked, hungry, tired, and sick, and not warm enough, and malnourished. And that's what you're like if you don't have enough money. And also, Yang, um, I, I don't remember if it was Andrew Yang or uh, this guy, Rector Bregman, who says it, maybe both of them. They noted that when you become homeless, you lose the equivalent of 15 percentage points in your IQ because your ability to solve your problems by yourself just gets completely decimated. You have to look to uh, shelters and other organizations to help so that you can solve problems. IQ is the ability to solve problems. Your IQ is diminished or you're out on the street. You need money to survive or we need to have competitive currencies and stop expecting or requiring people to use money to give what they need to survive. So instead of figuring out, how to, figuring out how to abolish money like a communist, let's just try giving people free money like the libertarian you know, Reagan advisor and Nobel Prize winning economist uh, Milton Friedman said. Yang has noted that Friedman and Martin Luther King and Thomas Paine have proposed similar uh, proposals with names like Citizens Dividend. Uh, Paine called it an annual stipend to all adult citizens. Paine's idea was to compensate people for the the inconvenience of having to have a zoning system and having to have government acknowledge whose property is whose. You know, government has to do that to be able to, you know, own police stations, own the land that police stations are built on, for example. And that zoning is what makes it necessary to have things like, you know, considering eminent domain. So the government has to compensate people fully for anything and everything they take from people. That's why the government should pay us money in compensation for making us use money. It's why the government should provide us defense in compensation for taxing us to support the police. And it's why, um, it's, why the, it's why Yang supports gun buyback programs, paying people for the guns that they give to the police. Just compensation is the Fifth Amendment, and Yang understands civil liberties. This is proof of it. You'll get your turn. The freedom dividend res resembles the negative income tax, which Milton Friedman did not invent or come up with. He, uh, it was someone came up with it in the 50s or 60s. Sergeant Shriver was an early supporter of it. Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, was a supporter in the 70s or 80s. This is the negative income tax. It's been described as an effectively progressive tax, but it's also it's actually flat because the flat part it, it dips below the poverty level. See, there's a zero tax level, which you could set at the poverty level if you want to. But the idea is, whoever's below the poverty level or whoever's below that zero tax level, people above it will pay taxes to support the welfare of the people below it, and you will bring people halfway between whatever their income they're at now and that poverty level or that zero tax level. So you don't disincentivize people from working because you're not bringing them all the way to poverty level, you're bringing them halfway. That's what Milton Friedman says as an example when he was explaining the negative income tax. He did not come up with it. But like I said, it's flat, but it's effectively progressive because it gives a bonus to people who are below the poverty level, below the taxable income level, and thus need it. And it will make people above that level pay to, pay to support the uh, cost of it. So this is arguably, you know, it resembled it. If you look at the kind of um, tax policy that Gary Johnson ran on in 2016, and the Libertarian Party nominated him after he supported it, uh, that was the national fair tax of 23% on all purchases. Yeah, I always now this fair tax had what you call a prebate. That is a that's short for a preliminary rebate. The plan of the national fair tax is to compensate people at the beginning of the year, preliminarily, before they pay their taxes throughout the year on all those sales taxes, the 23% sales taxes you're going to pay on each and everything they buy throughout that year. The national fair, fair tax compensates them before any of that. So it's arguably free money. Gary Johnson arguably ran on free money the last time the Libertarians had to choose for, uh, a nominee for president. So you can see it as a free money thing. You can see it as, I came up, I don't know if I came up with this, I mean, call it a refundable tax credit. Uh, they have, you know, I think it was Rand Paul, someone, someone supported refundable tax credits uh, for health insurance. And that would be, if it's refundable as cash payouts, if it's called non-refundable, then, if, then you can be eligible for receiving money. So there are tax credits that can give you money, there are tax credits that can't. This would be basically, the whole idea of this is kind of a tax credit because the goal is to either replace existing government revenue and programs 
or and or reduce it in the process uh, as people become less dependent on the government um, in order to reduce the size and cost of the government and uh, and give people a tax credit from that tax cut from that tax and spending cut hopefully if this program sticks around long enough, we'll have spending and tax cuts, and once that becomes possible, we can give people a refundable tax credit through giving them money by saying, hey, we cut the federal government budget, it was too much, here's your share of it, $1,000 a month, as long as you want it, stop anytime you want. Also, the Freedom Dividend will be funded by a value-added tax, and many people on the right support that, uh, whether they're in the Libertarian Party or not. Some people in the LP don't support the fair tax or sales taxes. I am personally not a non-supporter of uh, sales taxes. But like I said, Yang wants to basically bundle. See, this is what value-added taxes are. It's kind of bundling together all the taxes which should have been paid in the whole manufacturing, distribution, and sales process. See, those taxes sometimes get, usually get passed on to the distributor and, this, and the consumer. And that negatively affects the people who, you know, who need that money the most, and it doesn't really, do, you know, there's better things that we could be taxing than sales, and Yang wants to kind of take away the, uh, the consumer burden of having to pay for those sales taxes by making the producers and the distributors pay, most of them, before it even gets to, you know, the convenience store or the gas station or wherever you're buying it from. Another thing, and this is the most important thing to take away, if you take away anything from this, remember this. Receiving the Freedom Dividend is fully voluntary. You can opt into it, you can opt out of it, month to month basis, anytime you want. Also, amazingly, paying taxes to fund the Freedom Dividend is nearly fully voluntary. I explained before that Yang will allow what I call elective taxation. He'll allow citizens to decide what they think is a taxable event. Uh, of course, not get ridiculous, can't be a millionaire and get off scot free, tax free. And that is why the, the Freedom Dividend would be the first full, nearly fully voluntary government program. You, know, you could call it a bailout for the poor, but you know, don't we really need one? It's a tax cut to reward citizens for cuts in government spending and taxes. That's what it would be. Yang does not desire to grow the government. There's nothing unlimited, uh, unlibertarian or anti-limited government about this. He wants to replace 2.4 trillion dollars of spending and have the people, not the legislators, not the corrupt politicians, spend more than half of the federal government budget every year to make damn sure that whatever money is being spent in our country is being spent by we the people, the people who fund these politicians' salaries. Thank you very much. Okay. And do you want, we need a moderator. Okay, who has questions? <laughs> All right. All right, Andy, if you want to moderate. Okay, um Well, let's let's find out how many questions we got first. Why? No, I mean, you know, let's Okay, um you're you know, I I do you know anything more about Andrew Yang's Positions on infrastructure and energy, and can you elaborate a little bit more on that point? I don't know much about it. I, I did do a little research into the thorium. I saw the article you sent me. Um, I honestly didn't do any research past, past that, but if you want me to summarize it, Yang thinks that thorium would be safer, less expensive, and less likely to be used in uh, nuclear weapons than the current uranium that we have in place. But I think you sent me an article which right. says there are critics against that. I'm not a big science person. There, I'd love to hear your thoughts during rebuttals. Okay. Well, maybe my friend Ethan, who's pretty science-minded. Anyone, yeah, I, I don't know too much about it. Okay, next. Go ahead. All right, so Friedman's uh, Negative income tax was to replace all welfare, uh, basically, and there was a whole there's a whole bunch of preconditions for it. Basically, abolishing welfare uh, altogether and replacing it with that. Now, Andrew Yang is also uh, you know worried about automation, this and that. How come he's not going around talking about abolishing social security and abolishing the minimum wage that that exasperates? Uh, automation 
why isn't he talking about abolishing a bunch of other stuff if he's yeah. so supposedly a libertarian? And this just makes me see that he wants to augment things that already exist. Yeah. Well, he does. He does uh, support getting rid of federal minimum wage laws, or he at least criticize them. Um, you know, they only help people who already have jobs. And if you think about it, they only help people who are already earning whatever we're raising the minimum wage to. If we raise it from 725 to 925, everyone within that range, their jobs are not threatened. But no one who's earning less than 70, 725, i.e. basically homeless people, people living with their parents, whatever, um, no one's benefited by minimum wage laws except people who already have very high paying jobs. And Andrew Yang has criticized the minimum wage laws, and I appreciate him doing that. Um, he does not support getting rid of Social Security, I think because it's such a popular program. He, I think he would let see, uh, uh, he changed his policy at some point, so if I got this backwards, I apologize, but I think seniors are eligible for the UBI, it's just they would have to choose between whatever amount they're currently getting, they'd have to decide whether they want, you know, whether that's more than the $12,000 they would be getting uh, under their freedom dividend. And there's also a controversy about which benefits you'd be allowed to stack. Um, like get two or more benefits at the same time. And yeah, that's why Freeman was concerned, like abolish welfare, not do what Nixon just uh, Nixon wanted, which is, yeah, pass a basic income, but only if it grows the government budget. It's like, no, that's sabotage, that's not gonna work, that's not the point of all this. The point's replacing existing government spending. Um, I hope I answered your question, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, next question. <laughs> Where? Oh, where? Okay. George, go ahead. I, uh, the, um, it seems like Yang wants to increase the, uh, that, uh, that he's going to, that it's going to cost trillions of dollars and it's going to increase the national debt. And there's no income tax? He's just going to bankrupt the country. Well, there's, um, I'm just talking about my own personal view here. Income tax is half of the federal government's uh, tax revenue source. So we could get rid of the income tax as long as we double the expected revenues from everything else. Now I'm not saying all those tax revenue sources are good. I'm just saying there is a way to do without income taxes. We did without them until I think 1913, except for a brief period uh, during the Civil War. Um, and we are already in debt and adding to the debt and we have a deficit. So Yang would not increase the size of the federal government and um, don't assume that don't assume that he he wants to increase the total government spending one bit because he the whole point of the uh, freedom dividend or basic income plans and the way Freeman described it too is to replace existing federal spending. There's no indication he would add to the debt unless more people than expected enroll in the benefits like a lot lot. It's been okay. It's been said that uh, if the government would put on, were put on the same accounting standards that private industry was put on, that a lot of the governments would be uh, shut down for violating of uh, the uh, accounting rules. That's bullshit. They did it in a, uh, there was a case in point when the government was put on the same accounting rules as business, and that was in New Zealand, and now they're a booming economy. The program was called Rogernomics. Do you know anything about this, or do you think that might be a viable way of cutting down on government spending and getting a little bit more discipline into the financial systems of the government? I don't know anything about Rogernomics. I don't know. I don't know anything about what kind of standards the government and private businesses are are, are under when it comes to accounting. I would imagine private is maybe a little better, but I also think the government gives perverse incentives to business and gives them a signal, like. What did Elizabeth Warren's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau do except for, and I stole this idea from Ron Paul, I gotta admit, it made people have faith in the financial sector again and the government's ability to, you know, to promise that these financial products are good. Now, do we need that kind of faith? Depends on whether you trust those financial products. I think most of them shouldn't exist. I don't want some unknown European or Chinese banker selling my debt on the, I, don't, I have no idea what's going on. Um, I don't trust Equifax. I don't trust the Social Security system. So yeah, we need we definitely need accounting rules, stronger accounting rules, and 
you know, candidates like Claire Ball, a recent candidate for Comptroller of Illinois, she was saying that she would have every single dollar accounted for. And aside from people who do that and people who are CPAs running for financial positions, we also need to have full reserve assets, uh, get, rid, get rid of fiat currency and fractional reserve currency that the Federal Reserve does, and have full reserve. Um, try to work it back to the gold standard, but not just by having the people with the gold lord it over people, but by having everyone have a little bit of gold or whatever resource they want to back their currency. Oil, marijuana, big tech taxes, etc. Okay. All right, Charlie, you know you got a question, so fire away. Yeah, from what I understand, we come in a transit group and we would like some more buses on our transit system because the, the, the fleet is aging. We need them on Addison Street here to get home. From my, if you told me, Yang's infrastructure thing is to build space rockets. Absolutely, it's practically needed, you know. What does that benefit? us who would rely the 500,000 people who use public transit every day in Chicago. What good is a spaceship? Privatize it, Charlie. It'll be run more efficiently. Yeah, we'll I, I support your right to advocate for increased spending on public transportation. However, your, your focus of it seems to be on in Chicago, and Andrew Yang is running for President of the United States, and he would deal with infrastructure on a national level. You Your job is to catch the bus. Andrew Yang doesn't have to worry about it. Can you provide some? I forgot you're stuck in the 1960s. Have you heard of Uber or Lyft? Trains. Bernie Sanders wants to legalize hitchhiking. You might have friends with cars. All kinds of alternatives. I think a rock is going to All right, next, next. All right, Andy, you want to get up there and moderate a little bit? All right. Watch yourself, Andy. You almost knocked out our, our podium there. All right. <laughs> let's get on to our next question. Mr. Travis, please. Yeah. Uh, having Mr. Yang run for president during a time when there are crucial issues between the United States and China, isn't that a little bit like having a guy with a German accent run for president during World War II? <laughs> it would, but Andrew Yang is from Taiwan, not from China, and Taiwan has not exactly had friendly relations with China. Um, in fact, Andrew Yang's father is an inventor who's uh, generated patents, 70 patents for GE and IBM. Excuse which, me, that's not my point. Right, well, I was, my I was getting to my point. My point is the people would see him as Chinese. Okay, well, he, I know he's, he's not. Taiwan is the Republic of China. That's its official name. It is capitalist. It's not communist. Um, Yang does visit Taiwan, Taiwan regularly. Uh, there's no evidence he's a dual citizen, and he has no relations with China. Now, like, like you said, Americans perceive themselves as kind of almost in a war with China, militarily, IP. And I was about to point out, Yang's father is kind of an IP warrior, potentially against China for America and maybe a little bit of Taiwan, because he's generated patents for IBM um, and also for General Electric, which works with the military. So Yang could, could definitely be part of our you know, attempt to you know, continue our rivalry, you know, with China in terms of developing technology in a kind of competitive way, but not let it get out of hand because he's also Asian American, and I don't think he would go to war with what some consider his own people, even though it's a different country. Though not China doesn't feel the same way. Korea. Yeah, uh, Yang wants to decriminalize uh, OxyContin and heroin. Those are very addictive drugs. I don't think that's a good idea. What do you think? They are addictive, but the fact that they're addictive it, it's a concern, but it's not his primary concern. He doesn't want to legalize cocaine. Um, for, like, for one reason, it doesn't kill a lot of people. Two, it's not as addictive as those drugs you mentioned. But um, the fact that those drugs are addictive, you should also think about how widespread the use of them are and how many overdoses there are. There are so many people who are on opioids now it would be ridiculous to try to arrest all of them. It's like trying to arrest all the potheads in the early 90s. It's impossible. We can't afford it. It's an incursion into our civil liberties. So he says, don't send them to jail if they have opiates. Do take their drugs, um, but don't criminalize what they're doing unless they're doing something violent, which is perfectly in concert with what libertarians have been saying about drugs for 30 years, 50 years or more. 
I'd like to know why Andrew Yang is wanting to lower the voting age to 17. Yet now, for me to buy a pack of cigarettes, I gotta be 21. Used to be 18. And yet, it's 18 to go into the military, yet I can't drink in any tavern unless I'm 21. Don't you see kind of a double standard here in a little while, in, in some ways? I see a double standard on uh, legal ages to do things in Illinois and Chicago, Evanston, Hawaii, New York, things like that. I don't see any hypocrisy in Yang's stance, though, because I only know one of his positions on age-related limits, which is lowering the voting age. Now, you know, you can't establish any inconsistency or hypocrisy because there's no second opinion, you know, no second position to draw on to compare it to. But yeah, I definitely disagree with the whole. It's, we're we're raising the age of buying alcohol and tobacco, while well, we're lowering the age of voting, potentially, and lowering the age of kids can stay at home unattended. And that's stupid, that doesn't make sense. And I, I, I do agree with you on there, but Yang, I don't know enough about Yang to say what his thoughts are. I mean, it used to be 18 was the time that uh, a kid turned to be an adult, with, with all the adult responsibilities associated with it. Don't you think that if, uh, we're going to give them the right to vote and the right to enlist in the military and carry again. They should be able to smoke and drink at the same time. Definitely. I, I oppose increasing the gun purchase age. And uh, also, the military has allowed 18 to 21 year olds to drink legally. Oh, yeah, yeah. They've given, they given them a special permit. So that solves the military problem. Um, I don't have enough information to source that. But that's I've heard that people in the military allowed to drink just because they're in the military. But yeah, we should consider lowering the drinking age to 18. But you know, I would let states choose between 21 and 18. I, I don't know. But I don't. I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I don't support raising the voting age or raising the drinking or alcohol or tobacco or voting age or okay. purchase age. All right, let's. Uh, Over here in the corner. Yeah, can you stand up? Stand up and yeah. you know, yell it out. Oh. I was going to ask uh, if you heard about Yang's policy of abolishing the penny, and that uh, I bet that's a pragmatic option, and that it seems to be in line with his let's uh, come up with a way to fix the problem. Can you explain this the penny? Is a problem? The penny is a totally overlooked problem. Now, some of you might ridicule for that. I got ridiculed at a current events. A meeting recently about this. Why are you talking about abolishing the penny? I was told in my public school when I was some like 12, 14 years old, the penny cost 1.7 cents to produce. <coughs> penny production is bankrupt. It's been bankrupt for at least two decades. Uh, money's not worth what it's fa The cost of producing money has nothing to do with its face value. It costs the same amount to produce as a 10, uh, produce a 10 as it does to produce a 20. And the, the penny is losing the government money. And there's no reason, like, that is unsustainable. That should be abandoned. We should either abolish the penny and have the nickel be the lowest co lowest value coin, or we should find a cheaper material to make the penny out of. It's very simple. I don't know what uh, Yang's plan is beyond abolishing the penny, though. Okay, next. All right, gun buyback. Uh, you say it's voluntary. Oh, good. Uh, or, um, does that mean that the money that is the people, the money that's used to buy them back, the money is coming from voluntary sources? That's a good point. They are using taxpayer money to give the taxpayers money for their guns. You know what? I had a great way to, uh, you know, you can't, you know, Andrew Yang supports all this gun control, so he wants to give everyone $1,000. And I can't use that $1,000 to buy a gun because of all his gun control policy. But I figured out a libertarian black market way to circumvent that. You know the uh, the cobra effect, where the government says, "Hey, we'll pay you money for all the cobras you bring in because we're in India. We got to get rid of these cobras." What do people do? They breed as many cobras as possible and make ass loads of money selling it to the government. Now here's what we do: Supreme Court legalized 3D printing of guns all across the country. Let's mass manufacture 3D Bye. printed guns Bye. and sell them in gun <laughs> buyback programs and take all of Andrew Yang's money and take some of our <coughs> tax money as well. This is real logical. I make I was making a joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew Yang at least supports gun control yeah. a little bit. It's he would at least have to one say, okay, that's pretty smart. Yeah, I will give him some gun. All right, right let's let Charlie yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. What's the uh, the guidelines on this thousand dollars a thousand dollars a month? How will they have to be to get it? Eighteen years old or what? What's the deal? 
It's uh, 18 to 65. I think he also allows seniors, if they want to, if they're receiving less than $12,000 right now, that would be the only reason they would want to get on it. But I, I'm pretty sure 65 and older are eligible. So you have to be over 18 and you have to be a citizen, which means you can't be a child or an undocumented immigrant. And I think certain classes of immigrants are eligible and certain classes of illegal immigrants aren't. No, the sure. matter, class. Does it matter how much what your income is? No, there's no check, there's no means testing for income. And billionaires can get it, it's just that they probably won't, they'll probably choose to opt out. But he's, he's offering it to billionaires even though they don't need it because they're American citizens and because he wants just the fact that you're American to mean that you're an owner and a shareholder of our country, our government, and our, our money. That's a policy? Okay. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, um, I just got my question now. Um, you, you, you said the, that you want to abolish the income tax. It's my phone. Which Can you, you gave up? rather whimsical, silly reasons. I'm sorry for using that term. That's okay. For not for abolishing it because you have to get records together. And you also advocate using instead the value added tax. But the value added tax is only used in countries such as in Europe over the years where they have difficulty collecting income tax, which is the best tax for taking from the rich and giving to the poor. So your guy wants to get rid of the bus tax to take from the rich and give to the poor for no apparent reason. What's the question? People pay their income taxes here in the United States. It is not a problem. All right, could I ask you something? So you're not solving a problem by getting rid of it. Okay, well let's try to solve it then. So do you think that taxing corporate income is better than taxing the earned income of people you know, under 30, 50,000? Isn't that, a, isn't the ta taxing the income of people who are making money off of corporations, you know, publicly protected corporations, shouldn't they be taxed higher than the earned income of the poorest people? Isn't that a better way that's, to redistribute from the rich to the poor? Income people make. Right, but I'm, I'm trying to make a distinction between ordinary earned income of the poor versus the high corporate income Let's and corporate income taxes made Let's by the rich. I think, I think it's worthwhile to make tax. a distinction. I want to tax the poor less, Charlie. I want to tax the rich more, like but not because they're the rich. I want to tax the polluters and the criminals. <coughs> That's my position, not Yang. Yang wants to uh, have a value-added tax. He's trying to get rid of the income tax because it's too tedious. Yeah, it's, it turns, he said it turns every taxpayer into a tax expert, or they have to be a tax expert just to do their taxes. And it's complicated, and it wastes a lot of Americans' time. And Andrew Yang says it is that then people should be, it is no, it's that. it's not. Yes, it is. It's extortion. It's legalized extortion. <laughs> you just bribe us with their own money. You're trying to make up reasons to get rid of it, and they're not very good. <laughs> What's the reason to keep the income tax? We could increase the expected revenues of every other tax they're, revenue they're form and good. substitute it for the income tax, which we will have gotten rid of. We got by without the income tax for 140 years. We still had bridges. You're, you're sorry that we had infrastructure without taxes? Excuse me, please. This is supposed to be a question and answer period, You're not right. a dialogue between Charlie Paydock and the speaker. Right, I say. Yes. Uh, in, the, the, Go ahead. In, in, in the last debate, uh, Yang spoke for less than three minutes. Why don't why don't the Democrats let him talk? Because his views are just so far out of what's called the Overton window of acceptable dialogue. He's pushing it kind of to the left and down, left in a progressive direction, saying basic income, Martin Luther King. And he's pushing it in the libertarian direction by saying basic income, Milton Freeman, basic income, Thomas Paine. There's something in this basic income for everyone. For progressives, it's more money, poverty alleviation, more money for minorities, and you know, the drug, getting rid of the war on drugs is, you know, more freedom for everyone. And for libertarians, it's about economic responsibility, more financial opportunity, balancing budgets, just having new things in government. And then for neoliberal Democrats, it's about how are they gonna look legitimate again? How are they gonna look like they're getting on board with the internet candidate, the youth vote, disaffected voters, and new ideas, which are not really new because people have been supporting them for 50 years. Okay. Okay, let's give our speaker a hand tonight.
Let's go to rebuttals now. Who wants to hear a rebuttal? Uh, get your hands up, I'll take a count. We'll see how much time everybody gets. One, two, three. About uh, five, people? five minutes. Go seven people. Yeah. Okay. Let's Who's get up first? there. Who's first? Who's first? Mr. Travis. Uh, excuse me, but I really cannot overemphasize the point that I want to make here. And that is that uh, it is my feeling that drugs should be legalized across the board. Uh, liquor, well, same thing, and uh, guns should be legal across the board. And why do I feel this way? I feel this way because that, that with freedom comes responsibility. If drugs were completely outlawed, and, and you could not uh, own a gun, buy a gun, have a gun, then Excuse what me. would wind up happening is that I could walk into a, a, uh, a coffee shop and grab a policeman's gun and shoot him dead, and then say for my defense that, well, I didn't even know what it was. I, I didn't understand, which is exactly the thing that Mr. Adelaide Stevenson said when he killed a young girl in classroom with, with a uh, gun. So, and then he pleaded that he didn't even know what it was. And Mr. Stevenson got off on that. So the, the fact is that uh, with freedom comes responsibility. So if people kill themselves with drugs, then other people will know what the dangers are with drugs. Uh, if people kill people with guns, other people will know the dangers of guns. So people have to be responsible, and this is one of the things that comes hand in hand with freedom. If you're a free man, then you're free to own a gun. You're free to use drugs. You're free to drink liquor. Uh, you're basically free to do whatever you want, provided you don't interfere with somebody else's right to do whatever they want. So that is the essence of freedom. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Nuclear free is far superior to nuclear thorium. I respond to the, the critique of Andrew Yang's nuclear thorium platforms. My name is Dennis Nelson. I'm a naturalist and energy environmental research provider, speaker, organizer. I'm also a member of the Chicago based Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, Illinois' Nuclear Power Watchdog Group. NEIS has distributed a critique of 2020 Democratic presidential hopeful Andrew Lang's energy plan to address climate disruption with nuclear thorium. I use nuclear thorium instead of just thorium to point out to those that are unfamiliar with the topic we are talking about a form of nuclear power. This critique is by Nicholas R. Brown, an associate nuclear engineering professor at the University of Tennessee. His critique makes some good points about the higher capital cost of nuclear reactors, the highly radiotoxic waste, and the fact that the nuclear thorium fuel cycle will be nuclear weapons proliferation prone, not proliferation proof. At the same time, I strongly disagree that nuclear power is, quote, very safe, unquote. With the wide assortment of disasters, terrorist and saboteur threats, human errors, malfunctions, design flaws, and construction mistakes, inherently dangerous nuclear power is accident prone. Also, I strongly disagree with the so-called need for any, any, for any nuclear power. Constructing any new nuclear reactors will be unnecessary for the U.S. to achieve net zero climate disrupting emissions by 2049. I have given four different presentations 
hear about why a nuclear-free future is far superior to a nuclear thorium future. Three of them debates with the Thorium Energy Alliance, TSA. I have advocated two different yet complementary pathways to get off of all oil, gas, and coal without any nuclear. One is carbon-free, nuclear-free by Dr. Arjun Makajani, a nuclear and electrical engineer who is the president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. The other is the Solutions Project, based upon the work by Dr. Mark Z. Jacobson, a civil and environmental engineering professor at Stanford University, and his colleagues. The 50th anniversary of Earth Day will be on Wednesday, April 22nd. Charlie has already reserved the April 18th spot for my annual keynote Earth Day address. The title will be Tackling Simultaneously Our Climate and Extinction Crisis While Pushing for a Nuclear-Free Future. Please plan on being here because I'll be using new and different material to make my dynamic case. Very efficient LED bulbs, integrated efficient and solar building construction, fuel efficient cars and trucks, cellulosic ethanol and is sustainable biodiesel, all electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids powered by 100% renewable energy, electricity grid, renewably generated hydrogen, well-sided wind turbines to reduce or even eliminate bird kills, community-owned solar photovoltaics, and commercial and industrial cogeneration equipment are some of the options. They are much more effective than nuclear thorium in keeping more carbon pollution out of the Earth's climate system at a lot faster rates and at least cost. We have a cold red climate alarm going off and we are running out of time. While providing us with climate protection and climate stabilization, what I have outlined will also address our poverty by creating new green collar employment opportunities in the energy efficiency and renewable energy industries. Besides improving our economic well-being, other advantages will be enhancing our energy security, national security, and global security. Our public health and ecological health will also be improved by reducing the hazardous air, water, and soil pollutants from fossil fuels and nuclear power. Thanks a lot. See everybody here on April 18th. Okay. All, right. Thank you. All right, next. You're up. I think Joe's talk uh, was very informative. I learned a lot about Andrew Yang. However, I'm not convinced that uh, he is quite a libertarian. Um, uh, I, I don't. I, I just can't. I, there are libertarians that support a basic income, true, uh, or a or similar things like uh, like a negative income tax. Usually, those come with other sort of stipulations like abolishing a lot of other things and replacing it. Um, I'm, I don't, I've looked at Andrew Yang's platform on his website and it doesn't seem to me like he's very libertarian at all. It sounds like he wants to, I mean, he wants, he's got a big Medicare for all, maybe he wants to make it voluntary, I don't know, but even a public option, option would still require um, coercion. Um, I'm a. I. Whenever if you're gonna make it two thousand uh, dollars, the. Um, whenever you know, basic economics says the more you have of something, the more the less valuable it is. If everybody all of a sudden has a thousand dollars a month, a thousand dollars just becomes that much less valuable. I think that there will be a. That'll. I think it'll cause inflation. I think prices will rise, um, and a thousand dollars just becomes the new kind of minimum. Um, uh, and there's several. There, you know, there's there's several. I guess the one in Scandinavia didn't work because of internships. I don't know. Uh, it, this just doesn't seem like a libertarian solution to anything, how it's funded, how You're not open -minded. anything, uh, yeah, just, you know, 
Um, I mean, but he's not. I, I think he's very earnest. I think that he's not the he's not the worst Democrat that's running. I think that there's still a lot of. Uh, I think maybe we can educate Andrew Yang more on what better policy positions can be. He does say the L word, not in a negative way, so I can give Andrew Yang props for that. Uh, but I just am not convinced that he's libertarian or libertarian-ish. Alright, alright. This guy won't buy, he won't drink the food again. Well, the uh, three top Democrats for president are big spenders, including, uh, well, uh, Sanders, Warren, and Yang are big spenders. Uh, the democratic socialism has failed wherever it was tried. In South America, in Europe, any place it fails over the long run. You can't keep taking money from the rich to pay for the poor. Uh, although American youth are in favor of it, in favor of socialism. Medicare for all and free education is going to cost trillions of dollars. Uh, $1,000 a month for every American is going to cost trillions more. It's going to increase our national debt. And, and immigration, they want to have 18 years uh, path to, I got a speech problem, a path to citizenship. Citizenship. And I'm against that because uh, let them come in here legally. If they come in legally, I got no problem. But uh, they can't sneak across the border and become American citizens. Uh, uh, they, 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 these uh, candidates want to get rid of the Patriot, P Patriot Act. They want to make deep cuts. Now, that's going to weaken our military. We, we have to remain strong military, not only for the United States, but for other countries. And uh, they, they, they want 18-year uh, eight, 18 year, 18 year, year term limits on Supreme Court judges. I, I, I'm, I'm against that, too. But... Uh, I don't like these changes. Okay. All right. Joe, you got two negatives. Okay, I'm uh Wait a minute. You see, one of the things you guys have got to realize, especially about the immigration debate. I feel that within about 10 years or so, we're going to be actually paying people to come to the United States. Why? It's a simple matter of demographics. We're losing population because when our birth rate is, is low, as well as in most of the advanced industrial countries, it has been going down. Why has that birth rate been going down? Simple. Raising a kid today is a very expensive proposition. That's right. You know, when you have a kid, you're going to be expected probably by the time he's 18 or 25 or whatever to at least outlay about a million and a half dollars in his raising, care, feeding, education, and that kind of thing. And children are nice to have because they are our next generation. Used to be in a lot of countries they were looked at as a source of security because the more kids you had, the more better off you were in your own age, and they were a source of labor for your family farms. Now, they're an expense to be had and to be raised. I am not advocating not having children, but we're not having enough to reach a stable replacement rate of our populations. Other countries are. That means there will be a shortage of jobs in the next few years. And the first thing that happens when jobs start getting scarce and is that the immigration walls go up. And then it, when they finally figure out that that doesn't solve the problem, they go up. We in the United States right now still have plenty of room for immigrants. On a population per square mile basis, we are still one of the lowest in the world compared to Europe or some of the other countries. Second, our climate change can easily be solved by getting another source of energy. And I know Dennis has talked about all this carbon-free, nuclear-free stuff, but when you consider the amount of land and resources it would take to develop solar and wind for a city like Chicago, 
it would take almost half of Northern Illinois to produce most of the energy that Chicago alone would need. Why not look at something that's been around for a while? We are operating nuclear plants. There's about 400 in the world. And I think there was about 57 incidents over the last years of these lives of these plants that were brought up. The point is we are in the road to making nuclear power a much safer alternative. I'm advocating that the uh, thorium molten salt reactor as well as others. And the regulatory, in the last year or so, the regulatory uh, environment has changed. There has been a recent opening up of getting some test reactors in the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and in Oak Ridge where they'll be trying out some of these new advanced designs in the United States. China is still moving forward with about 600 people in the uh, research of these things and as far as getting nuclear waste most of that can be burned up and recycled and uh, long term actinides be gotten rid of in the, in the form of uh, other once they're used up in another reactor I uh, Charlie you don't know what you're talking about I do I just read it <laughs> one full at a time see Charlie I've attended the, conf the, the Thorium Energy Alliance conference and have talked to a lot of these uh, nuclear people myself and have thoroughly questioned them in a lot on these things. I'm hoping at some future point to really get into the college here as what this can do and I know Dennis is going to be giving a real good presentation on the anti-nuclear side but you know both of us do have points. I am not going to knock Avery Lovins for not uh, you know for for his things because energy efficiency is a good thing. Solar panels do work. Wind does work. But we're still going to need high, high certain, uh, we are still going to need a lot of energy to run an advanced industrial society. I like pressing the Atlantic in a day. I like driving a car. I like having heat, light, and power for my uh, home. And when I, when, you know, if it's a matter of me having heat, light, and a home versus uh, global warming, I'm still going to choose at my own interest heat, light, and a home and energy. Uh, we're going to get it somehow or another, but I think um, what a lot of these environmentalists want to do is deindustrialize the United States <coughs> and uh, bring us back to the Stone Age. I know Charlie certainly likes all those images of peasant farmers from the former socialist countries, but I'm sorry, I'd much rather see them in homes and factories and good jobs with a good advanced industrial society. Thank you. <coughs> I'll have a few comments that I'll haven't been uh, addressed by any of the other rebutters or speakers tonight. <laughs> uh, Deindustrialization uh, in the terms of stopping burning coal and oil and switching to clean alternatives, that's uh, renewables, solar, wind power. For those of you that don't know, solar and wind power are now cheaper than fossil fuel or nuclear anywhere on the planet. Where? Now we're divided, we're divided between people that know certain facts and people that don't. <laughs> when, when something becomes common knowledge, like uh, Galileo was first, he, they threatened to burn him at the stake, but people came along with him with telescopes and say, hey, he was right. Today you can't get burned at the stake or even criticized for saying the earth revolves around the sun. Well, today, you can't really get criticized for saying that I think child abuse is a bad thing. Pretty much all of us agree that we should do something about child abuse. We should do something about uh, kids being left to die in uh, poor areas. If, they, if the parents don't have money to take the kid to the hospital and get treated, just let them die. These things are fundamentally wrong. And the rest of the world, the enlightened world, has pretty much declared that the right to breathe clean air, the right to clean water, these things are universal human rights. The right to housing, the right to clean food. This shouldn't be a capitalist dream where if you don't have the money to pay for these things, you just starve and you die. That's fundamentally wrong, but uh, the libertarian view on a lot of these things, uh, and the, the Republican view also. The for those of you that haven't been paying attention, we're, our country is at war. We're we're not we're not at war. Nobody we're not at war with Middle Eastern countries. 
the Republican Party itself is waging war on the middle class and the poor in America. That's where the real war is. Charlie pointed this out earlier. The Republican Party is trying to get rid of all environmental regulations that regulate corporations that would dump mercury or lead or benzene in the water. Just let them run free like the robber barons did, you know, a, a hundred years ago. And that's where we are. And also, we're still divided between people that don't know. On the one side you have, it's 99.9% .9 now of all climate scientists in the world accept the facts about global warming and climate change. It's less than 1%. <laughs> that are in dispute, and those are basically intellectual prostitutes that are paid to create doubt the same way, it's the same <coughs> prostitutes really that took money from the tobacco industry for 40 years claiming that there's no evidence that cigarettes are addictive or that secondhand smoke is harmful to children. Uh, their job is to create doubt after the facts are totally known. So, it's Martin Luther King, I read it earlier, it's embedded in one of the articles on Common Dreams today. One of Martin Luther King's famous quotes was, nothing is more dangerous than sincere ignorance or conscientious stupidity. And we see blends of that every single night here at the college. <laughs> People are terrifyingly ignorant of facts on one subject where they're really knowledgeable on something else because of the way that book targeted and the others talk about how the media, especially Facebook now and the others, are maintaining Americans in an incredible <laughs> bubble of ignorance. And there's, if you just crunch the numbers, crunch the numbers and find out, this looks like my time is up, give me another 10 seconds. There's, there is no debate at all anywhere that nuclear power cannot debate with cheaper return. Wow. Solar energy, like cheap cell phones, came down way beyond the, well, the cost of nuclear power. Solar and wind put nuclear power to shame, and solar is really fusion power. The fusion reactor is out there, 93, miles of, 93 million miles away. It's not here on Earth. We get an enormous amount of energy every day from a giant fusion reactor with no pollution problems of any kind. <laughs> and it, it just puts... But we still have people, my friends even. I was once pro-nuclear until I started learning the facts. And, and so yeah, we can learn. Uh, you know, uh, you, that's, that's the essence of the human race. We have a brain. We can learn things. We yes. can move forward. Why don't we do that on these critical issues? Why don't we follow the kids, six million of them out of school now every Friday all over the world in 150 countries, protesting the idea that they have no future beyond 2040. They have no viable future. There's going to be climate refugees, hundreds of millions of them, moving in all over the place as, as the coastal cities are devastated. This is what's happening, and it's happening right now. All you got to do is look at pictures of Australia to see what climate change and a little higher temperature is doing to that continent down there. So we, we have we have a 10 year window here, 2020 to 2030. We can't be looking about taking eight or 10 years to develop thorium when the planet is actually on fire in a lot of places. So maybe, maybe 50 years in the future, thorium would be, we'd have small thorium reactors just like, like the Jetsons we heard about flying around you know, 50, 60 years ago. No, well, that might be 50 years in the future, but it's not now. We have to face the reality of what is going on right now. I look forward to hearing Dennis's speech on uh, okay. on Earth Day. But uh, anyway, uh, anybody else want to give a rebuttal or is it? Yeah. Okay, Charlie. Come on up. All right, Charlie. All right. Let's. Uh... Hey, how you doing? Yay. All right. Let's think. I speak. Oh, oh you want to give a rebuttal? Oh. oh. You're, you're, you're last. <laughs> All right. Bring us home. How's everybody tonight? We're fine. Great. Okay, I have to agree, of course, with um, the science regarding climate change. And um, like Andy had said, I mean, over 90% of um, climate scientists agree regarding um, the effects, clim climatic um, catastrophes that are going on. Okay, so um, the potential is there regarding renewable energy. The potential is there, you just need to invest in it in order to progress and move forward. And um, if the money um, can be um, 
invested in the renewable energy, we have the potential to um, surpass um, the um, fossil fuel energy that we're getting now. But uh, regardless, um, uh, lastly, I, I want to say that, um, of course, America's carbon footprint is um, or surpasses a lot of other countries that, um, so I, I think it's a, a it's a, a more, more a basis of morality um, to reduce our carbon footprint, whether it's the whole basis of being inconvenience, well, oh well, well, we're surpassing our carbon footprint um, over a lot of uh, the population in the world, so why do we have that convenience? It, it, it's immoral. It's, it's a basis of um, morality to reduce our carbon footprint, whether we like it or not. And if we're inconvenienced, uh, oh well, that's the reality. We have to grow up. We're, we're not being mature enough to do what we have to do. And if that means everybody has to take the bus uh, to reduce our carbon footprint, oh well. Um, cars eliminated. Uh, all cars have to be electric. Okay, that's reality, and so good goodbye to our conveniences that we've had for too long that the fossil fuel industry has given us. We have to grow up, and why should other countries have to face um, our um, what we're doing? Why, why should they have to be impacted at the level that they are? And um, I'll uh, end with that. Thanks. Excuse Thank me. you. My yeah. cars. My car is only half electric. Do I have to get rid of only half of my car? That's correct. Only half. Just the background. Turn it in, you get some money. All right. Turn the camera on. All right, come on. What did you say? Low camera. Low camera. Why? Okay. Charlie. Are we all done? All right, Charlie. Get up now and anymore. Can you put this down? Yeah, Charlie, just, just, you can just, yeah. All right, let's thank our Joe again for, for a nice program. He nicely edited. He put together 50 concise arguments uh, in support of his candidate, which is commendable. Uh, I don't know if he got any converts to the cause. And apparently, <coughs> a few people here have not uh, taken the poison. Uh, all right, I'll be eclectic here. George, uh, capitalism uh, works fabulously, right? Yes. During the week I read that there's a retail or restaurant chain that's closing 450 <coughs> stores or outlets. Uh, because they're not also, keeping up with I the read an article they're not keeping that up with the, the times, railroad Charlie. industry was uh, at its lowest ebb, blowing up thousands of employees, the greatest unemployment since the Great Depression has hit the railroad to the United States, uh, and you're telling me, well, this works. What is failure? What is broken by your, what criteria are you using? Railroads it works. It works <laughs> with unemployment, by people who are out of work. 3% unemployment those businesses, now, Charlie. those empty lots and empty buildings, that works. All, all right. Carriage well, all right. Let's all those see carriage else manufacturers. Also, all those the other day during the week I was reading, I just happened, I don't know, I glanced, uh, somebody sent me something uh, on Thorium. There's, there's sites like Thorium Debunked, and they said Thorium is radioactive, minimum of 400 years. Uh, if you have a reactor, you're going to be dealing with radioactive materials in some quantity for several hundred years. We can do it. Now that's a good idea to produce pollution that will kill you that is odorless and colorless and will kill you uh, and have to, and then it, goes, it exists for 400 years. And along with that, I read that uh, in Three Mile Island, none of that east there, uh, a million to two million people were exposed to radiation. And some people actually come forward and want to do this again. They irradiated millions of people, and they suggest that we do this again. And this time, there won't be any problem. Now, I don't know if I want to take that deal. Now, regarding the ideas of your candidate, <laughs> I just so happened to look at a 
a campaign of this a little obscure thing called the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And they put forward a candidate and vice president. Well, candidate. Now, your guy's given, guaranteeing $1,000. But they looked at it and they said, no, we think everyone should have a guaranteed income, some with the same thing, or a job. They also said people should be guaranteed health care, housing, education, and they listed a number of things. They said people should not be required to purchase these. They should be furnished at a minimum level. I think this little party of socialism and liberation has achieved greater thought in putting together a plan than your exalted candidate for president of the United States. Now, David, regarding freedom, you keep yelling, oh, my freedom, my freedom, my freedom. If my loony neighbor has weapons, which he can use at any time, and he gives his, his loony children access to those weaponry, what, is, what does that do to the freedom of the people that live next door to him? What does that do to the freedom of the community? Does it expand it or does it restrict it? Because any time you go out, you could die at the hands of a nutcase. And then you sit around and you advocate expansion of guns. And, and then you say, then you say, oh, freedom. This is freedom. This will be freedom. Oh, they will go to jail. How wonderful. After I'm dead, he will go to jail. This is, come on. All right. Well, the only good for a it is. Here. All right. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. <laughs> now, the other thing is, all right, I'm going to go back to Guns this. are bad. But you got two things here. Guy, guys <laughs> buying guns back don't work. They don't sell any really good guns. Well, gun control is Weapons or assault weapons, and they sell some rusty old thing from the Civil War. And they're not going to sell their weaponry. They, this is... Believe you me, the gun guys are not going to part <coughs> with their weaponry, no matter what deals you're given these days. So that one, does, that one goes off in outer space. Now this other thing is, oh great, I get to sue if my loony neighbor shoots me. And I get to sue him and the gun manufacturer. Do you know how these works? Do you have any idea? When you sue these things, now you gotta get a law firm, and they want five to ten thousand dollars up front to take your case, <laughs> and they'll drag you on for years, and the gun manufacturers and so forth have staff attorneys, and they will drag you on for you. And guess what? Your lawyers will come back to you and say, "Oh, if you want us to continue the case." Give us another two thousand dollars, and this goes. Oh, they're on. like the government with our. They will taxes. keep draining you. Otherwise, they will drop you. So this candidate for president is an attorney, but you say he didn't practice law very long. But that's common knowledge that those things won't materialize. The other thing is. Uh, We've had some of these guys over the years at the college. You know the one guy, Ed Gambos, has proposed various themes like this over the years. We had any number of candidates at one time for president of the United States. Ed Gambos, he had red and green money, depending on if one was earned in, in an honest fashion or, or another kind of money if you earned it like through entertainment I love it. Or, or something like that. Uh, the only other thing I heard here, that I, you didn't get into too much detail, I could be wrong, but <clears throat> the government should compensate people who have expenses for compliance with the regulations. And if that's what this guy is proposing, that's ridiculous. But anyhow, thanks, Joe. That was very interesting. All right. Good talk. Speaker gets the final word. Speaker gets the final word. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. I think I won this one. <laughs> this is a debate society. Thanks so much for coming and listening. This is a lot of complicated topics, a lot of new ideas in political science and economics. It's really important to keep up on all these things. Um, 
I became a libertarian in uh, 07, and after college in 09, I started studying things like Henry George, mutualism, basic income, resource-based dividends, and, and, uh, and money. Um, just the kind of things that I started looking into after Ron Paul was like, we need competing currencies, and Federal Reserve is doing everything all wrong. Uh, Andrew Yang gives a unique attention, amount of attention to economics, and that's why we can all learn from him. I'm just going to address the people who uh, criticize me. Um, Justin, I agree we uh, need to talk to Yang, the LP, and give him some continuing education. He could be, you know, he could be better, he could be more against professional licensing that stops the growth of, uh, you know, jobs and he, the ease of people getting jobs. He could be better against gun control. Um, I disagree with you, Justin, that a public option doesn't require coercion. I think as long as it's truly optional, public option, like I'm advocating, or like Yang is advocating, one that's truly optional to pay for and be a part of, that would not be, by definition, that would not be coercive. But I do believe that those Finland internships that you were asking about, those are coercive. People were defrauded and coerced and tricked into accepting unpaid internships for two years. That's immigrants and young people in Finland. The Finland basic income program failed because they started requiring work for welfare. It's not because they paid people and they chose not to work. <clears throat> they, they tinkered with the fact that it was unconditional. They made it conditional. They made it no longer a truly universal basic income program. So what failed in Finland did not resemble the freedom dividend. It resembles a conditional income, which is not UBI. Uh, the next gentleman spoke after Justin. This freedom dividend is not a rich to poor redistribution transfer of wealth. It's a redistribution from everyone to everyone. Almost everyone's going to pay some form of taxes, even the poor will probably pay some elective taxation if we have good government that's good enough to want to fund. And it, the, you know, it's opt-in. You can you know, there's elective taxation for the most part, and you can choose to opt-in or out of the freedom dividend. Um, and I agree. Um, I disagree with that gentleman that we need to spend any more on military or the cuts to the military are going to hurt anything. We outspend the 18, the next 18 countries in military spending, and we could reduce our spending on military by two-thirds and still be outspending China. Um, Tim, I agree with you, the cost of raising children is very high, a million dollars, and that's why the you know, Freedom Dividend could help mothers, especially single mothers, make ends meet and take care, take care of their children. It would also potentially inspire women to leave abusive husbands. It could also inspire young women to choose to receive the Freedom Dividend instead of becoming prostitutes. So this could not only heal, you know, race relations in terms of it being kind of like reparations, and uh, also get kind of get the um, get the heat off of immigrants for taking our jobs when it's robots that are taking our jobs. So, and another thing, uh, we can have production without pollution. We don't have to we don't have to put up with deindustrialization as long as we have environmentally sound um, new companies that don't pollute. Um, libertarians, by the way, my presentation was on Andrew Yang. It was not about how the environment is bad or how the earth needs to be destroyed or how I believe in climate change denial. Libertarians don't hate the environment. We just don't think, we think the EPA could be doing better. There's plenty of progressives who admit the EPA could be doing better. If it can't do better, then we should abolish it because there's also no constitutional authority for it. Libertarians see environmental, uh, environmental issues and pollution as a property rights issue. Pollution is a violation of the property rights of the person whose property or body or air they breathe that you're polluting. Libertarian society would not be so free that it allows people to pollute or harm people or shoot people, Charlie. You can't just shoot people for no reason. Of course we don't believe in the right to shoot people for no reason as a part of our freedom. That would be ridiculous. I'll ask my looming neighbor if he's got a reason. Call, call the cops on him. Property. Feel free to call the cops on him. I'm not stopping you. Um, I agree that I, I personally need to know more about nuclear policy. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, you know, learn more about Yang's comprehensive environmental policies to tell you more about it. Um, I have to t tell you, Charlie, you know, you're worried about what's going to happen if you, know, you can't sue a gun manufacturer because you're going to get shot first. You should be more worried that the cops aren't going to arrive by the time that you need them. And you should also check out copwatch.org and coplock.org if you think that you know the people should give out their guns before the cops and the military should. If you want a truly gun-free society, then the police and the military have to give out their guns too. And I don't know why Charlie was criticizing the right to sue gun manufacturers. Yang's full position is that he actually wants to find them. Um, but I don't think it's legislators role to decide what happens. I just think I want those lawsuits to be possible because it's not my decision. It's not a president or a legislator's decision. It's a jury's decision whether gun manufacturers are responsible for people who get shot. One last thing, I agree with the 
party for socialism and liberation idea that people should see the idea that the PSL was saying people should be compensated for their services. Charlie was noting that the PSL wants to make it optional to use you know housing and comply with all these things. Um, Charlie seemed to be endorsing that, but then criticizing it when I'm, when I'm saying that we should compensate people to comply with gun buyback programs and want to be paid money for having to use money. It's a fair trade-off. Thanks. Okay, Mark Campbell, us out, Andy. And that's it for the College of Complexes this Saturday night, and we will see you all next week. We're adjourned. Thank you.